Liberty. Yeah. I, think we, we <laughs> I hope they know it. I love Marie, too. Like, we Marie just debated knows. hard. Yeah. Now, yeah. you guys, we were talking about basketball during the break. We, have we agree a, on LeBron. <laughs> <a fantastic laughs> and there time. you have it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, it's always a, a lovely day when you were here. Thanks so much for making Outnumber to part of your day. We are back on the couch tomorrow at noon Eastern. Right now in Fort Harris. Faulkner, here is the one and only Melissa Francis. Fox News alert, a landmark Supreme Court decision today upholding President Trump's travel ban. This is outnumbered overtime. I'm Melissa Francis in today for Harris Faulkner. The high court in a five to four decision ruling that the president does have the authority under the law to regulate immigration in the interest of national security and rejecting claims that the ban on travel from several mostly Muslim countries is discriminatory. President Trump releasing a statement saying in part that the ruling is, quote, a moment of profound vindication following months of hysterical commentary from the media and Democratic politicians who refuse to do what it takes to secure our border and our country. But Democrats on Capitol Hill immediately blasting the decision. Here's Illinois Senator Dick Durbin. We need to keep out every dangerous person who tries to come to this country. It's categorically uh, brand people because of their religion or their uh, background, what country they're from. It's just not the way we do, should do things in America. Shannon Bream is live in the Supreme Court with the latest on this. Shannon. Well, uh, the court, by a 5-4 decision, obviously didn't feel the same way that Senator Durbin does. Writing for the majority, the chief justice said the text of this proclamation says nothing about religion. And he said, you got to remember, too, that it only impacts 8% of the world's Muslim population. So if that's the ban, if that's the plan, it's not very effective. He also writes this about the president's power, quote, the proclamation is expressly premised on legitimate purposes, preventing entry of nationals who cannot be adequately vetted and inducing other nations to improve their practices. Now, while the conservatives found the president was lawfully within his executive powers based on both the text of federal immigration law and the text of the so-called travel ban, there were two separate strong dissents, including one by Justice Sotomayor, who said the majority was wrong to ignore the statements President Trump made on the campaign trail when he was a candidate. She writes this, quote, the president's statements, which the majority utterly fails to address in its legal analysis, strongly support the conclusion that the proclamation was issued to express hostility toward Muslims and exclude them from the country. By the way, the critics of the ban, and you can hear a lot of them here demonstrating, they're speaking out now. All right, Shannon Bream, thank you so much. We're going to go to the White House right now where we're getting comments from the president on this very thing. Uh, he is going to talk a little bit about the travel ban and the Supreme Court's decision today. Let's listen in. Thank you very much, everybody. You have probably all seen, otherwise you wouldn't be at the top of your game, the fact that uh, today's Supreme Court ruling uh, just coming out, a tremendous success, a tremendous victory for the American people and for our Constitution. This is a great victory for our Constitution. We have to be tough and we have to be safe and we have to be secure. At a minimum, we have to make sure that we vet people coming into the country. We know who's coming in. We know where they're coming from. We just have to know who's coming here. The ruling shows that all of the attacks from the media and the Democrat politicians are wrong, and they turned out to be very wrong. And what we're looking for as Republicans, I can tell you, is strong borders, no crime. What the Democrats are looking at is open borders, which will bring tremendous crime. It'll bring MS-13 and lots of others that we don't want to have in our country. It'll bring tremendous crime. So I will always be defending the sovereignty, the safety, and the security of the American people. That's why I was put here. We're discussing today uh, the funding of the wall, which uh, we very much need. We started the wall. We're spending uh, a lot of energy and a lot of time and started up in San Diego and other places. It's under construction now. We have $1.6 billion. But we're going to ask for an increase in wall spending so we can finish it quicker. It stops the drugs. It stops people that we don't want to have. And it gives us security and safety. And with that, uh, if you, uh, I think we might just take a quick spin around the room, talk to a couple of the folks. Uh, 
And uh, maybe, Senator, I'll ask you, Roy, do you want to say a couple of words about why we're here and what we're doing? Well, I think with the leadership... Okay, uh, that, that was the President of the United States, obviously, talking about the Supreme Court decision today and, and big support of it. Let's bring in Republican Congressman Darrell Issa, who serves on the House Judiciary Committee. First of all, you want to respond to the President's words there? Well, I think the President understands that he's, he's been given back, if you will, uh, a clear resounding victory of his national security authority. And that's really what Chief Justice Roberts was pointing out, is there's a valid national security interest there. The President's order was narrow, and it, and it addressed that. Uh, obviously, uh, at the same time, they were rejecting the religious claim, since only 8% of the world's Muslims were there. And in fact, for example, Iraq, improve their system for verification uh, and and that was the goal was to wherever possible improve it but for example in war-torn Syria there's very little likelihood in the near future we're going to be able to properly vet where who if people are who they claim they are and that's exactly what the Supreme Court recognized uh, and rejected uh, the claims that the uh, that many of uh, many people have made and remember during the same period of time we we welcomed refugees and immigrants from all over the world a great many of them of mm -hmm. that faith so I mean as this decision comes down a lot of people think that that either you or the president would be thinking so this clears the way for what next well, I think it clears the way for targeted executive orders and executive action to protect our, our borders, both literally and figuratively. Uh, and at the same time, I mean, this administration is working very, very hard to stabilize Syria and to deal with, uh, with terrorism and with the refugee crisis. I just left uh, King Abdullah. Uh, a matter of five minutes ago, uh, where the number one reason he's here is to try to get a Syrian refugee solution that the United States uh, can take a leadership role on, because that's more than any other place, the largest displacement uh, since World War II of, of any nation. Where do you stand on the immigration bill right now in the House? I mean, this is the thing that's top of mind for anyone on the sure. outside looking in. Are you going to be able to get a deal together? Well, I hope so. Uh, we have been, uh, my entire 18 years of service, trying to get uh, two things done. One is some real reform that change uh, a broken immigration system that rewards accidental uh, application rather than merit. Uh, and that's part of what this bill does. At the same time, it also helps strengthen the border. It adds E-Verify, uh, a good idea but not yet mandated. It makes it mandated. And all of that will both strengthen our ability to uh, hold our borders from illegal immigration, but help resolve uh, the sins of the past, if you will, dealing yes. with DACA and so on. And so there's a lot of good things in the bill. Everybody has a reason to vote no, but I think there's a reason to try to get to yes. Are there, you say try to get to yes. Are there enough votes in the House right now to get to yes? If Democrats who wanted to vote for this bill because of the good things that were in it were allowed to by uh, Nancy Pelosi and the other leadership on the Democratic side, we would easily get there. Whether we can get to 218 Republicans, or 215 right now Republicans necessary uh, to, to do it is, is questionable. That's a, that's a big question of can you get almost that every sounds Republican. That like no, sir. I mean, it, so no, it sounds like look, no. No, I'm, I'm, I believe that we have a real chance to get to it. I'm continuing to work. There have been additional things added to try to bring more Republicans. But again, if just a few Democrats would look and say, I will participate, uh, I want to be heard, and I will participate, this would be quite easy to do. And most immigration reform should be and can be bipartisan, but it's the, uh, it's the Democrat leadership that has made it painful for any Democrat to cross so lines what, on this issue. What change do you think needs to be made in order to get enough votes? I mean, if you were to get those last few Republicans, what tinkering do you think would have to happen in order to get that done? Well, the president has shown leadership in saying DACA is on the table, and I think all 200 and however Republicans do agree that, that the, it's within the president's rights. So they're all buying into some form of DACA fix. It's the enforcement side that has some on the right not willing to be there, and perhaps not enough in the way of guest worker program for some in the middle. Uh, but I think we can get there. Certainly the addition of an agricultural guest worker program mm -hmm. was important for a lot of moderates and a lot of members from farm states like California. Uh, but again, we're doing this with no help from the Democrats, which is just wrong because they want so much of what's in here, yeah. including uh, the DACA fix. All right. Congressman Darrell, I said thank you. Thank you.
Fox News senior judicial analyst Judge Andrew Apollo joins us now. Let me take you back to the actual decision and what was said by the Supreme Court. It's always amazing to me that a group of justices can look at a law and look at the same words on a paper and interpret the constitutionality of it so differently. Well, two things. Some uh, justices interpret the words literally, and some justices interpret the words to encompass certain values. And some justices want to look at words that aren't even on the paper. Mm. So the dissenters, led by Justice Sotomayor, and I say this as somebody who's a, a friend of hers, were animated more by what candidate Donald Trump said when he was running for office, much of which was very incendiary about uh, Muslims, than they were about what President Donald Trump wrote on the on the executive order. The majority, led by Chief Justice Roberts, chose just to look at the words in the order, and those words conformed almost precisely to his constitutional authority and to the delegation from the Congress to him to regulate, control, and even stop immigration in order to enhance national security. So where do you think the administration goes from here? I mean, no doubt they will be emboldened to a certain extent by this. What's the next thing they try to do? Well, I, it, it's hard for me to say. Remember, this order has been in place since the Supreme Court last looked at it uh, since April. At that point, the Supreme Court, uh, excuse me, two Aprils ago, the Supreme Court said, we're going to keep this in place until we can finally rule on it. Uh, and they, they ruled with finality today. So someone could attempt to come in, who's a Muslim from one of those countries, and file a complaint as to why the order doesn't apply to them. I've already been paid to give this speech at this uh, lecture. Look at my personal history, and I'm not a threat to anybody. A judge might let them in. They can't challenge the order for being unconstitutional anymore because the Supreme Court has ruled, but they can challenge whether or not it applies to them. Will this embolden the president? It probably will, yeah. but that's really, I'm smiling, because we both know what he's like. That's really up to the creativity of his imagination, which can be pretty creative as to how he wants to use these powers. Yeah, I mean, it makes me wonder if, so if Congress isn't able to move on the border, um, that then at that point, you know, does he go to the executive order? Well, he may try, but, but this uh, Supreme Court opinion today is limited to rulings that A, are based on national security, and B, where the Congress has delegated the authority to him. The linchpin today is a federal statute in which Congress specifically said, and presidents have used this statute going back to Eisenhower, any president can, after making the following findings, danger to national security, in difficulty of weeding out the bad from the good, block a group of people from a specific geographic location for a national security uh, reason for a finite period of time. So whatever the president's going to do, we'd have to fit into those four, cate those four categories. It seems like, though, on the southern border, I mean, that's, that's exactly where you could make those kind of arguments. Well, the problem with the southern border it's not those who are trying to get in legally. It's those who are trying to get in illegally. Mm -hmm. So he is already using the authority he has, including assistance from state uh, um, reserves and, and National Guard to, to shore up the southern border. So th this is not a, a, a case that reflects his power on the southern border. He, if he wanted, for example, mm -hmm. to ban all Mexican immigrants uh, for national security reasons, well, that would stop them from coming in legally, but he'd still have this issue that we've been confronting in the past two weeks because of the separation part of illegal immigration. This, yeah. this whole order only pertains to legal immigration. Right. Um, does it impact any other decisions that are out there right now or waiting to come up? Does it make you look at anything else differently? Uh, yes, there are many challenges to the uh, executive order that judges were sitting on waiting for the Supreme Court to rule. Yeah. Now, whether those challenges can move forward depends upon what they're based on. If they're based on, I'm different, I'm an exception, the court's going to hear the case. If they're based on, this is a Muslim ban, the court is not, court is not going to hear the case because the Supreme Court has ruled that it's not a Muslim ban. Very interesting. Judge Andrew Palatano, fabulous as always. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. We are joined now by California Democrat John Garamendi. He is the congressman who got a firsthand look at ICE facilities housing migrant children over the weekend. Let me start with your reaction to that. Well, everything that America doesn't like about it is actually taking place. We saw in a uh, reception, a hardly reception, uh, actually it's a jail. A family sitting on, lying on a concrete floor, uh, several, uh, maybe eight or nine or ten of them, and 
one thing that really caught my attention was a young girl, maybe four or five years of age, just barely able to see over the top of the concrete sill in her uh, jail cell, uh, and just tears streaming down her face, totally alone. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a very, very bad situation at the ICE detention facility, which is really a minimum security prison, uh, similar to any other in the United States. Uh, there were mothers that had been separated from their children, unable to really get back in touch, having no real notion of where their children were, mm -hmm. and unable to even to phone them because they didn't have any money in which to pay for the phone call. It's just a bad situation. Uh, it really hasn't ended. The zero tolerance thing has just created a different set of problems. The separations presumably are not going to continue on. But now we have a couple thousand children that okay. need to be reunited. So, so yes, there's a major problem. Wh what do you see as the fix to this and also to the 80% of the kids that are in custody right now who came without their parents and are not here with anyone? Well, that's been an ongoing problem of the unaccompanied minors. Uh, they do wind up uh, somewhere in the United States uh, for at least some period of time. Some are sent back to the country from which they came if there's a, a ability to identify the families and so forth. Others are finding their way here. There is a problem in those uh, states in what the Northern Triangle, Honduras, Guatemala and El Salvador. Uh, that issue in those countries is going to have to be taken care of. Otherwise, these people are going to continue to seek something better something better is but, the United what, States. What do you see as the fix to the facilities themselves? Because the president uh, has talked about opening up military bases. Would that be better? I mean, certainly you don't want to just release yeah. well, children they, into the community. Well, that's certainly the case. Uh, there is a place for a family uh, that is a family unit to be put on an ankle bracelet and give it a specific time to appear at a court appearance. Apparently that is very, very successful and they do, 90, 80, 100 percent of them show up for their court order and they're either deported or they do uh, obtain asylum. That's all possible. But the cages that we did see, that's just not, not right. Mm -hmm. It okay. may be a very temporary by the hour until they moved off to maybe a military base, which would be far, far better, no doubt about it. Okay. Let me ask you about the Supreme Court ruling today. Yes. What's your reaction to that? Well, the Supreme Court looked at this not as a Muslim ban, but rather as a ban of certain countries where there apparently is an inability to determine whether a person seeking a visa is going to cause problems in the United States, be a terrorist, be an Al Qaeda member, whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, and so in that context, the question comes down to can those countries provide the necessary information to the State Department to identify who the individual is and that they are not a threat in the United States. Now, apparently we have, in the current context, a total ban on travel from those countries. My guess is that is going to be very quickly modified uh, in several of those countries, maybe not all of them, Yemen being one example, mm -hmm. uh, where the State Department is able to gather sufficient information about an individual, say, a grandmother that wants to come and see her grandchild here in the United States. Is that grandmother a security risk? Yes, no. If yes, no, you don't get a visa. If you are uh, not a security risk, mm -hmm. you get a visa, come to the United States. So there ought to be a determination with the State Department uh, to be able to determine with the local government that the person is or is not a security risk. That's yeah. a modification that could easily take place here, and I would hope that it does happen that I, way. I mean, there were countries that were on the list, and yes. they were able to prove that they could come up with background information, they could work su successfully with the State Department, in court, uh, including places like Iraq. I mean, that, that yes. makes you think that this doesn't have to do with religion, that it truly has to do with trying to communicate with where these people are coming from. Well, uh, Presently, this Supreme Court order clearly doesn't deal with, the, with religion. The problem is this started actually during the campaign and then carried on into the early years of the Trump administration where it was perceived, correctly or incorrectly, without getting into that, as a ban on Muslims. Mm -hmm. And that created all this problem. Now, in the intervening time, the president and his staff modified the rhetoric that it dealt with countries who we could not have assurances, mm -hmm. provide the necessary information about the individuals. That's clearly the case in Yemen. Uh, Iraq, that's not the case, I believe, any longer in Iraq. Syria is a mess. 
probably yeah. applies there. So what we really need to do here is to make certain that people seeking to come to the United States either to work under one of the uh, work visa programs or in a, in a visitor visa or even a student visa, that there is sufficient background information on that individual. It sounds like you agree with the ruling, assurance. sir. It, I mean, it sounds like you agree with it. Well, the gentleman, I guess it was a retired judge that preceded me. I didn't get all of it. Yeah. He went into it, I think, in very good detail. And if uh, yeah. it would be well for us to listen carefully to the way in which he described the variation. Yeah. Uh, we have forever, uh, except for the European Union, had a program in which we would vet individuals that wanted to come to the United States for a student visa, a work visa, or a, just a visa, a visa to, to tour the United States. Yeah. Uh, prior to 9-11 and then prior to ISIS, uh, it was just basically wide open. And we relied upon the European countries to very, very carefully vet people that were seeking a visa from those European Union countries, not all of them, but nearly all of them. They provided the insurance. Now that we backed off of that with the immigration wave that went into the European countries where there was an uncertainty that we could or okay. could not. Sir, I'm so variable. sorry. We have to interrupt you because we're going to the White House and I thank you, Congressman Garamendi, so much for your okay. time. Let's listen to the president again. <clears throat> I'll be real short. We need the border security line. That's all we need, border security. We got to get going. A lot of bad things are happening, and I think we're doing it incredibly well. We have no tools. We have bad laws. We have the worst immigration laws in the history of the world. Okay, it's a, it's a joke. People can't believe it. Other countries look at us, and they say, "How is that possible?" Somebody touches our land, we now take them to a court, to a judge. They want us to choose five thousand judges. How do you choose five thousand judges? Can you imagine the corruption just from a normal standpoint, just common sense? Can you imagine the corruption? Go to the barber shop, grab somebody, make them a judge. Everybody's being made a judge. They want 5,000 judges. More. It's crazy. Other countries, it's called, I'm sorry, you can't come in. You have to leave. This one, we have judges. If they step on our land, we have judges. It's insane. So we're going to have to change our whole immigration policy. And I, I was saying last night in South Carolina, when I came in, I inherited some things. We inherited North Korea. That's going really well. We inherited horrible trade deals. That's going really well. Nobody knows what's happening behind the scenes. But these countries that have been really, they can't even, I don't blame them. I blame our people. But they have just been ripping us for years. They want to negotiate so badly, you have no idea. Uh, we inherited a lot of different things, but of all of them, immigration is makes the least sense. It is a hodgepodge of laws that have been put together over years, and we have to change it. It's so simple. It's called, I'm sorry, you can't come in. You have to go in through a legal process. You don't have to see a judge where the judge is going to take three years before you can come back. In the meantime, you never come back because you're already in the country. You're someplace in the country. And that would be bad, but it's really bad when it's a criminal. And we have plenty of them coming into the country this way. And they use the children. They use these young children for their own benefit. So we have to change the whole immigration picture. And we'll be able to do it. We need the border wall. We need the border. We need border security. <clears throat> and we need modern equipment. And we'll get it done. I have no doubt. Uh, Anybody else would like to say something? Anybody? Are we okay? We'll let these guys go out and have lunch. John? Um, on trade, uh, there are some people who are saying that your, your tariff threats threaten to plunge the economy into a recession. Harley Davidson announced that it's moving a plant to Thailand. You've been very Harley critical Davidson about that. Harley was going to do that. They announced it early this year. So Harley Davidson is using that as an excuse. And I don't like that because I've been very good to Harley Davidson and they used it as an excuse. And I think the people that ride Harleys are not happy with Harley Davidson and I wouldn't be either. Uh, but mostly companies are coming back to our country. Uh, I was the one that explained to Harley about 100 percent tax in India where they had a tariff of 100 percent. And I got it down to a much lower number. I think it's 50 percent, which is far too much. But they were paying 100 percent tariff. Now, uh, 
Prime Minister Modi brought it way down, but it's still way too high. No, I will say this, John. Other countries are negotiating. And without tariffs, you could never do that. And if they don't want to negotiate, then we'll do the tariffs. And just remember, we're the bank. We're the bank that everybody wants to steal from and plunder. And it can't be that way anymore. We lost $500 billion last year with China. We lost $151 billion with the European Union, which puts up trade barriers so that our farmers can't trade. We can't send farm products in for the most part. It's very hard to send cars in. We have countries where, as an example, India, they charge up as much as 100 percent tariff. We want the tariffs removed. What I would like to do and what I offered at the G7, you remember, I said, let's drop all tariffs and all barriers. Is everybody OK with that? And nobody said yes. I said, wait a minute, folks, you're complaining. No tariffs and no barriers. You're on your own. Let's do it. And it was like they couldn't leave the room fast enough. Hey, what do you say? People say it's, it's a risky uh, business here. You could tip the economy into recession. And then what do you plan to do well, later first this of all, week? We're so high up. We're so high up. We've picked up 40. Uh, if you look at the kind of numbers we've picked up, uh, it's up almost 40%. The market, and that's not the real market, is the overall. And the overall is up much more than that. But we picked up about $8 trillion in value doing what we're doing. Now, we've got a little bit of uncertainty because of trade. To me, there's no uncertainty. And to other people that happen to be smart, there's no uncertainty. But we can't allow the European Union to take out $151 billion out of the United States. We can't allow Mexico to have a NAFTA deal that gives them over $100 billion. And I call it profit. You know, you can divide that up any way you want to do it. I call it profit. We can't allow Mexico to take $100 billion. We can't give China anywhere from 375 to 100 to 500. It's 375, some people, depending on your formula, $375 billion. It could be $504 billion. It's a tremendous amount of money being taken out of our economy. We have to straighten it out. Now, what's happening? We put steel tariffs on. Our steel industry is going through the roof. U.S. Steel just announced they're expanding or building six new facilities. Uh, last night in South Carolina, right? Go ahead, Georgetown Steel. The factory's been closed, the plant's been closed. How long, Lindsay? Uh, about three years, but what's interesting is a British company, a steel manufacturer in Britain, bought Georgetown Steel to make steel here. Right. Solar panels. We put tariffs on solar panels, 30%. They were all being made in China. We had 32 different factories. Now they're starting to open again. Plants, new plants, because solar's pretty new technology. We had 32. We had two that were open. Everyone else was closed because of what happened and what came in from other places, in particular China. And now we have seven that are opening and many more considered. And the two that were dying, they were going to close. They're thriving right now. Washing machines that were being dumped all over the country. Not good ones, by the way, ones that didn't work really well. And now they're opening up washing machines. We put a 30 percent tariff on. So tariffs could be a very positive thing. You know, in the old days when we had tariffs, we didn't have income tax. When people wanted to come in, you look at the days of McKinley and some others, when people wanted to come in, they had to pay a price. When they want to come in and raid our treasury, they had to pay a price. We didn't have income tax. You didn't need income tax. We didn't have debt. So we're doing this. I will say, in every instance, every country, any country that you can mention, has been extremely nice, uh, even eh, less to the media probably, but extremely nice. They want to negotiate a deal. So, and we're open to that. We're open to that. But it's going to be very strong. We are putting on tariffs on certain industries. We can't lose our steel industry. Our steel industry was ready to go out of business. It was, it was at the bottom. Our aluminum industry was ready to go out of business. Now the steel industry is thriving. Think of it, United States Steel, first time in 35 years, they're actually expanding. It's going up. They're building new places. Georgetown Steel closed for three or four years. They announced yesterday they're opening up their plant 
It's been closed for four years, I think they said, in South Carolina. Uh, no, we're doing the right thing, 100 percent. And you know you have them on both sides. Some people agree, some people don't agree. The bottom line is countries are coming back now to negotiate, including European Union wants to negotiate. Because if they don't, we're going to tax their cars. They send Mercedes in. They send BMWs in. They pay almost no tax. When we send cars to the European Union, they charge us a tremendous tax, five times greater than what we charge them. But more importantly, they don't want our cars. They have a barrier. We don't want your cars. But if you do get it in, you're going to pay a tax. With China, with China, if we send a car to China, they charge us a 25 percent tax. So we make a car, we send it to China, we want to compete. That's not free trade. That's stupid trade. So we send 25 percent tax. When they make a car in China and they send it here, we charge them two and a half percent. OK, so we get two and a half percent. China gets 25 percent. That's not fair. That's not free. That's just stupid. In terms of Chinese investment restrictions, I think you've got an announcement. Well, it's not just Chinese. It's, it's we don't want people coming in. Hey, look, we are a very smart country. We have the most incredible people in Silicon Valley. We don't want China and other countries. It's not necessarily or particular because they covered it incorrectly. Uh, they had either a leaker that didn't exist or a leaker that didn't know his business very well. But they gave it to Bloomberg and they gave it to, I believe, the Wall Street Journal. Then it was either a bad leak by somebody that didn't know, but probably they just made up the story. There was no leak. I've been a long term. I'm not sure if my political friends would agree, but I think a lot of leaks aren't leaks. They're made up by the writers. They don't exist, the leak. But this was a leak that was just off. We want, uh, we want to have our jewels. Those are our great jewels. <clears throat> That's like United States Steel from 70 years ago, these companies. We have to protect these companies. We can't let people steal that technology. We have the greatest technology in the world. People copy it and they steal it. But we have the great scientists, we have the great brains, and we have to protect that. And we're going to protect it. And that's what we were doing. And that can be done through CFIUS. We have a lot of things we can do it through. And we're working that out. But the bottom line is we have charged a very substantial tax to some people. They are coming back to negotiate. And frankly, if they don't negotiate, I'm OK with that because I'd rather get the tax. OK, any other questions? So the Supreme Court ruling was a tremendous victory for this country and for the Constitution. The Supreme Court, the Supreme Court ruling was a tremendous victory for our country. Will you go ahead with it, sir? Of course. What do you think? I wouldn't go ahead with it. Does it embolden you about the also to the idea of deporting people without due process as well? Do you think? Uh, we have to find a system where you don't need thousands of judges sitting at a border. Other countries look at us and they think we're crazy. They say, what kind of a thing is that? They have countries where they have no problem with people pouring in. And you have countries where people do want to go in. And if you look at the European Union, they're meeting right now to toughen up their immigration policies because they've been overrun. They've been overrun. And frankly, a lot of those countries are not the same places anymore. And I'm sad to say it, and I said that at the G7. They are not the same places. But we had a tremendous victory today, and uh, we greatly appreciate it. We needed it as a country. That was a big victory for, and I can tell you, everyone at this table is very happy about it, but that was a big victory for our country. Do you okay? consider that the final word, sir? Well, I think it's pretty much a final word. It's Supreme Court. You know, we went up and we'd, we'd win it, we'd lose it. We'd, we just waited for the Supreme Court. Yeah, that's the final word. That's Supreme Court. Now, do I want to go in with a different one and maybe a different variety? I don't think there's any reason. That's a very strong victory. Very strong. How much, how much in terms of wall funding, you said you wanted an increase. How, do you have a figure? Well, we're spending 1.6 billion now. There's a plan for another 1.6 billion, but I'd like to ask this room if we could increase it. I think in what, in light of what's happened with the drugs, with the human smuggling, with all of the problems, uh, we have to have the wall. We have to have the wall. You know, you in the walls, you have ports of entry. You have ports of entry. That's where people come through, and they can come through legally. And by the way, I want people to come into our country because our country is doing so well. 
And we have companies moving into our country, like, at numbers that nobody's seen in a long time. We need workers. So I want people to come in. They have to come in through the merit system, though. They have to come in so that they can help our country and these companies. In Wisconsin, you have Foxconn, one of the great companies of the world. They make the laptop for Apple and iPhones and or a lot of them. And they're building a tremendous plant right now in Wisconsin. They need workers. I have to let people come in. But they have to come in through merit. They have to be people that can love our country and help our country. Okay? Thank you all very much. No, no, no. We'll see. We'll see. All right, joining me now is Dan Henniger, deputy editor of the Wall Street Journal's editorial page, and Judy Miller, author and Pulitzer Prize winning investigative reporter. Judy, you did not like that. What was making you gasp there? Well, I think there were so many contradictions in what the president like what? said. Well, for example, he talks about the protection of intellectual property, and yet he's willing to give ZTE, the Chinese company that has been stealing our intellectual property and is a great national security threat, so the Congress thinks, to our country. He's willing to give them a pass. I mean, the president well, they, they did... they pay quite a bit of money. I don't know if that was a pass. I mean, that was a giant... I, I, I don't think they're... I don't think they're bank account thought it was a pass. Letting them operate in this country, given their record, raises questions. That's why you have the pushback from Congress. I think you see statement after statement by the president, which is really a kind of a half truth mm -hmm. or omits the context you need to do an even handed assessment of whether or not his policies make sense, okay. such as his trade policy. I think, and I want to get to trade in a second because he would, there, some of the things he said were very revealing right there, but let me stick with immigration and what we heard there on the end and I thought it was interesting that he's now echoing some of the points that we're hearing from the house which is this idea of the ag workers the yep. e-verify a way to bring people in for the labor shortage that we do have that is an opportunity I don't think we had heard a lot of that before real physical ways to get that done yeah and the question then would be Melissa is in fact the president committing himself committing himself to those pieces of the legislation that's in the House. I mean, this was an interesting exercise. The president right. really covered a lot of ground there in yeah. talking to those people. <laughs> and as someone in the administration said recently, the president provides what they call broad guidance on these issues. But when the rubber hits the road, you have to have a piece of legislation that has A, B, C, D, specific language and that's the, what they're struggling with in the house right now what will the president commit to or what will he won't and as he himself said we have to change our whole immigration policy yeah. but to do that you have to know specifically how you want to change it and that's the discrepancy at but, the moment but, between the white house and the house but i don't see i think if you're listening closely i don't think there was a discrepancy because he echoed the points that we've heard from lawmakers at the top of this hour that were on this show where they said it was the bill that you saw but we need to add some, we've added ag workers, we've added E-Verify, right. we've added a way to get people into work. That's the way that we're getting people on board in some of the states like California. I mean, he seemed to echo back what we heard from lawmakers at the very he top of this He has changed hour. his position Absolutely. several times in the past yeah. week. Now, but this if, is a signal I agree with what's going on right now. You don't think that? If that can hold through to the point of holding a vote later today or tomorrow on the immigration bill, then possibly they can make some progress. But mm -hmm. I think the White House or the president would have to say, yeah, this now is where I stand. I'm in favor of E-Verify, agricultural visas, uh, dreamers. And that would be the big one, it whether they legalize like, the dreamers. It sounded like he said that he's trying to shift to where the bill is now in order, in, in other words, signaling I want to get this done. Let's get this done. Exactly. After telling Congress to not to go there because it couldn't be done, he's trying to find a way to make it happen. But as you pointed out in your interview with Daryl, Daryl Lisa, he even Daryl Lisa doesn't think it's going to happen. He doesn't think he has the vote. So the president's scrambling. It's good that he's flexible because that's the only way this is going to get done. But I still question whether or not they're going to be able to come up with the votes, the Democratic votes they need to get this through. Yeah, they're not going to get any Democratic votes. <laughs> they're only going to go to the right. It sounded like from what Daryl Issa said was, I said, what changes do you think that you need to make in order to get more people on board? And he was talking about it's that language about getting those other people into the country that can do the jobs based on that's how you get through those states. Yeah.
Do you think it's something more than that going to the right? You think it's about the, the DACA language? Because he made it sound like they had kind of sorted through that. Yeah, they're trying to sort through it. I don't think they're worrying too much about Democratic votes at this point. What no, they're, they're worrying about is getting something that the Republicans can actually vote on because there are all these Republicans running in November right. would like to have something they can take to their voters out there and say, I voted in favor of A, B, C, D, and E. And the question is, how do you include both something like E-Verify and uh, legalizing the dreamers. That's kind of where the dispute is among the Republicans in why the is House the, why right is now. That a di why is that a dichotomy? Because with the dreamers, they're saying you can get on the, on the end of the line after a period of time. And with E-Verify, they're saying we got to know who everybody is that's coming to work. Well, up till now, the most conservative members of the House have not wanted to include the Dreamers in the bill, and the moderates have a problem yeah, with right. the E-Verify, but they're not going to get anything done unless all those elements are in a panel. Dan Henninger and Judy Miller as well. So there was a lot of talk about the tariffs in there. Um, the president said, we're doing great on the trade deals. It's going really well behind the scenes. We can't tell you about it. A lot of people would be surprised to know we had really terrible deals before. But without the tariffs, we couldn't get any new deals. I think what he's doing is starting a trade war. And this is what those of us who favor free trade have been warning about all the time. A 31% tariff on Harley-Davidson was partly responsible for their decision to move. And the president made a statement, which was factually incorrect, that, we, that Harley was closing the Missouri uh, plant in order to expand into Asia. The fact of the matter is those two decisions were unrelated to one another. And Harley, it, whether or not he, t he says he's going to tax motorbikes coming into this country mm. that Harley sends here. The fact of the matter is Harley sells bikes here, so he's not going to be able to tax anything. So this plan that he has to live with the tax revenue instead of a good trade deal mm -hmm. is really an empty threat and a dangerous one. He said that they made the announcement that they were expanding over there before he ever talked about the tariffs, and he said that without the threat of tariffs, you have no leverage to renegotiate these deals because why would anybody ever re renegotiate a deal that they were winning? Well, we do now understand the president's theory of trade negotiations. He does say that unless he threatens these tariffs, there will be no deal. Okay, that's the road forward to a deal. At this point, we have no deals, okay? We have the threat of tariffs and we have tariffs about to be imposed. We have no deal with Mexico, Canada, the European Union, or China, where Xi Jinping is saying, I will punch back, all right? He said at the end of that press conference today that, okay, if we don't get a deal, I'll take the tax, I'll take the tariffs. That means, in effect, that those 25% tariffs on imported goods will raise prices in the United States, all right? And I think the president's view is, you know, to make an omelet, you got to break a few eggs, and that we're supposed to be able to absorb that. The question is, are more workers or consumers going to be hurt than the ones he says are benefiting from the tariffs? I mean, that would be the issue there. Well, I, I it think... It can't the, help the, everyone. The calculation is that he's going to get a deal. He thinks he's going to be able right. to make a deal, and that you have to say, I'm happy with the outcome the way it is, or else nobody's going to believe. They have to believe the madman is willing to go forward with the plan or else you don't take his threat seriously. He's saying I can live with the tariff money so that they know he's serious. We're also seeing, you know, Asian stock markets get hurt by this. Everyone's hurting as a result. You think it's a game of chicken real quick. It is a game of chicken. There's no yep. question about it. See it. Dangerous chicken. game. Dangerous chicken. All right. <laughs> the Justice Department declining to provide more information to House Intel Chair De Devin Nunez about the reported use of FBI informants while investigating President Trump's campaign. Why that is. And the Department declining to provide more information to House Intelligence Chairman Devin Nunez about the reported use of FBI informants while investigating President Trump's 2016 campaign. The department says the FBI has already provided a classified letter and that it must protect its sources. Joining me now is Republican Congressman Jody Heiss of Georgia. He is a member of the House Freedom Caucus and the House Oversight Committee. Sir, thank you for joining us. What's your reaction? Yeah, listen, this is exactly why we need to get to the bottom of this. We've had a stonewalling for a year and a half with the documents, the information we need to do our job of oversight. And Rodenstein has been right in the, the middle of that. He's shown a pattern of stonewalling without uh, responding to subpoenas, without giving documents, even earlier this month, threatening staffers 
Uh, and we've got to get to the bottom of this to find out what really took place. You know what their response is. This is part of an ongoing investigation, and until the Mueller probe is over, they can't show you the documents. What do you say? Well, it's also part of an ongoing oversight that we have. You know, the oversight is necessary to make sure corruption is not taking place. And we have the right constitutionally to, to uh, ensure to the American people that corruption is not involved in this whole investigation. Look, there are three things we know from the I, IG report that came out a couple of weeks ago. We know that in the uh, Hillary investigation, there were FBI agents who were extremely bias against the president. Text after text, email after email clarifies that. Secondly, we know that many of these people not only were infected by their own bias, but they were willing to use their status and their position in the FBI to try to influence the election. And then we also know that many of them went to the Mueller probe yeah. and they were involved. So <laughs> this we've got to get to the bottom of this, Melissa. Speaking of that, um, you know, you're one of the lawmakers that wants the names of those who worked on the Mueller probe. What would you use that for? And do you think that they're going to hand them over? Well, you know, I, I frankly don't have any confidence in Roden style. I, like I said, he's been stonewalling, uh, perhaps even obstructing for over a year with this. But listen, what we're trying to get to the bottom of, no American citizen should have the, the scales stacked against them when there's an investigation taking place. And here we know there was extreme bias against the president. They were willing to even try to alter the election. And then many of them were put on this Mueller investigation probe. So we need to find out the list of these, uh, these people, these individuals, so that we can find out who they are, so that we can do our job of oversight to ensure that uh, a, a fair investigation is taking place and that this is not a witch hunt. Do you think that there are more in there with beliefs like Peter Strzok and some of the other individuals where their thoughts were revealed through those texts, but we know the names of a lot of those people. Do you think that there's Absolutely. even more than that? I certainly believe so. The, the IG report itself, I mean, the American people now are familiar with Peter Strzok, Lisa Page. They're becoming familiar with the name Kevin Klein-Smith. But we know from the, the IG report there were more, at least two others that were probably involved. We also know that there are already uh, part of the uh, Mueller probe at least eight uh, attorneys who have been strong supporters of Democrats and the Democrat Party. And so we want to know who else is involved yeah. in this thing? We've got to have that list of names to vet it. My, Michael Horowitz, the IG's job is only half done. He did the first part of the investigation about the Clinton email scandal. The second part is going to be about the Russia probe. Why not wait until he finishes his work? Well, we certainly are. I mean, that we, we are going to see what he finds, but we have oversight responsibility ourselves. And at this point, the IG report that has already come out uh, has raised a, a lot of questions for which we need answers. And part of that is the fact that many of these biased people willing to use their position to alter the election, they went from there into the yeah. Mueller probe. So it is our responsibility. We're just pursuing that which we have a duty to pursue. And of course, uh, Horowitz will do his investigation. As do you well. have faith in him? I mean, how do you feel about the job he's done so far, Michael Horowitz? I think he's done an incredible job. And in various hearings we've had with him, uh, the, the on oversight committee, he always seems to be one that's a straight shooter that's very fair. I think the IG report that he came out with uh, likewise does that. I thought it was extremely okay. thorough, and I look forward to the upcoming report. Congressman Heiss, thank you for your time today. We appreciate it.